Welcome to another episode of From Sunday to Sabbath. We were once a Sunday church, but have now worshiped on the Sabbath. Join us on this journey and discover the life that you were created to live. Discover the epic life, real love, real people, real purpose. Hey everyone, Mike Scan here. Welcome back to another episode of From Sunday to Sabbath. It is an honor and privilege to join you today. Um, I've got something a little different today. So number one is that if you tend to follow our podcast on YouTube, I'm not doing a video with this. This is only for those who have joined us on our podcast. And I want to talk about, I'm going to kind of go through a message that I have already did. Uh, I, I preached probably, I don't know, several weeks ago. And uh, I just want to do a synopsis on it because there's a powerful word in here for you today. And that is, as the title says, uh, the cost of discipleship. We're getting ready to gear up to celebrate Hanukkah. It's uh, right around the corner. Uh, matter of fact, this Sunday, we got a lot, or this Sabbath, pardon me, I <laughs> still do it. This Sabbath, we have some really cool things happening. And uh, we've got, like, in at the church itself, we've got, uh, uh, we're going to be uh, immersing or baptizing some folks. We're ordaining some people. Um, just some really neat things that are happening in our community. And I'm super excited about this um, because... Uh, it's just a, it's just showing the growth of what's happening here in this small church in Terrell. So if you're ever in the area, man, I want to challenge you come come check us out. Um, if you want more resources that we have, you can follow us on Facebook. You can join us on our face or our YouTube account. Just look for Epic Life Terrell on YouTube. And then of course, don't forget to share this podcast with all your friends and family and. Uh, cohorts. And I know we've got people joining us from all over the world. Uh, last I checked, uh, I think we're in about six or seven different countries, including Canada, India, um, Deutschland, um, Africa. Man, it's just really cool what the Lord's doing. And so I hope you'll drop us a line. If you're listening, man, join me, uh, join a line or just drop us a line on our email. You can email us at mike at epiclifetarot.com. Drop me an email. Let me know where you're from, what you think about our content. And if you have something you'd like me to talk about, I'd absolutely love to do it. So today we're going to talk about the cost of discipleship. This is going to be a longer, probably a little bit longer broadcast than I'm normally doing. But I simply want to get some things out um, about what this means and what it means to be a disciple. Um, this is probably one of the most confused, I think not one of the most, obviously it's not one of the most, but it is a very confusing uh, topic. What does it mean to be a disciple or disciple, yeah, disciple of Messiah, Jesus? And in, you know, once we have repentance, or the word is in Hebrew, the word is teshuvah, repentance. Um, and I think because of the way the church has uh, communicated what this looks like or what this means. There's a lot of confusion, but teshuva or repentance encompasses more than just a change of heart, but actually it's turning one's life into a different direction. And I think the confusion comes from a lot of people don't know what that means. They don't know what that life should look like. Like we'll say things like, you just need to love Jesus. Okay. Well, what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, you just need to follow God. Okay, that's great. But what does that look like? And I think this is where the church has fallen short because you go to church, you maybe do the secret prayer, the prayer, right? The, the sinner's prayer. You turn your life around or you don't turn your life around, but you make this profession of faith and then you get immersed or you get baptized. But what does it really mean to be a disciple? There's no instructions. Well, here's the thing that we have missed is that this book, this Bible that we have, it tells us, it tells us what it means to be a follower. God gave us the rule book and the, the, the guide um, to follow him. You know, we used to say the Bible, B-I-B-L-E, um, basic instructions before leaving earth. And I think this is their, the instructions for living here on earth and for living in the kingdom to come. And so I want to talk about that today. Let's let's unpack it. What does it mean to be a disciple? Well, you know, I think nothing communicates this more than the calling, pardon me, of the 12 disciples. 
Because being a disciple is about forgetting whatever life you had. I want to say that again. Being a disciple is about forgetting whatever life you had and now living with, eating with, and giving up one's life to, to learn the way of the teacher or the master. So it's whatever life you live prior to coming to the knowledge of Yeshua. It's more than just saying, okay, I'm going to say this prayer, and now I'm a disciple. I believe there's more. We were just talking about this last night during our, our prayer meeting. And we were talking about how we come, we say this magic prayer that we just leave people, and we like we don't teach them what it means. And so you kind of have to find your own way, right? But if you're going to be a follower of Messiah, it means that there should be a lifestyle change. And it's not just a lifestyle change, um, you know, by you, you know, creating some good morals, acting a different way, acting new. It literally, man, is a change that happens inside your heart. And this is not a new concept in the in the New Testament. It wasn't because Jesus came on the scene somehow, you know, this is a new idea. It's not a new idea. It's something that they had been doing. And they were actually accustomed to being disciples for many, 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 many years. The Hebrew Bible uses two words for this, this understanding of a disciple. Uh, the, the, word, the first word is the word Talmud, T-A-L-M-I-D. The word Talmud occurs in 1 Chronicles chapter 25, verse 8. And it refers to a student or an apprentice in basically kind of musical instruction. We'll read here in 1 Chronicles chapter 25, verse 8. They cast lots for their divisions on the principle of small and great alike, teacher as well as students. So this word indicates that, that their student, it, it's the word student, right? This word Talmud. It's the word that we get for a student. So uh, part of being a disciple is being a student of someone else. Um, the word lumed is used in Isaiah 8.16. It's the other word for this word disciple. And it's used in reference when Isaiah refers to the group gathered around him as my, I quote, my disciples. So we'll take a look at it. Isaiah 20 or Isaiah 8.8. 8, I'm sorry. Isaiah 8. 15 and 16. Many young, many among them will stumble, fall, and be broken, snared, and caught. Bind up the testimony, seal the instructions with my disciples. So we get this word, lamud, lumid, L I M M U D. Um, and so this is great because it carries us over into understanding what it truly means to be a disciple. In Luke chapter 6 of the, of the Barit Hadashem, it tells us what it is, right? Luke 6 and verse 40. A disciple is not above his teacher. This is that same word. But everyone who is fully trained will be, will be like his teacher. In other words, if we're going to say we're a lumid, we're a teacher, we're a dis or we're we're discipled, we are to become like the one who is discipling us. Listen, I might be a teacher, and I may even be, uh, you know, you may consider me as a your teacher, but the great teacher Jesus Yeshua is the one who's doing the discipling. We see that throughout Scripture. It's the Holy Spirit's job to lead us into truth, to help make us into disciples. In Isaiah 50 and 4, where discipleship is characterized by an educational process um, of speaking and listening. So there's a process that happens. You don't just become a disciple. Listen to me today. Discipleship or being a disciple is a process that happens over the course of time. We have to set ourselves in a place to listen, to sit, to to listen to our teacher. Looking at Isaiah 50, verse 4 and 5. Watch. It says, Adonai Elohim has given me the tongue of the learned that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to give heed, what? As a disciple, 
Do you heed, do your ears heed the voice of Messiah? Does your voice heed like a ready, like a student ready to learn from his teacher, from the Lord? And then we go into Isaiah 54 and 13, where it seems that there's a relationship that can be applied to disciples of both Yahweh and even human masters. Looking at Isaiah 54, 13. All your children will be taught by Adonai. Your children will have great peace. So if we want peace, if we want to be the men and women that God's called us to be, then we must put ourselves into a position to be disciples. By definition, a disciple was a learner, a student. It required the art of imitation. Listen to me. Peter is a great example of this. He was being called away from what he knew. Remember, he was a fisherman, and he had a boat, and Messiah approaches him. As they come out of the boat, after they've gathered all the fish, Messiah looks at Peter, John, and James, and says, look, drop what you're doing, come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. You have to understand, we have to understand the significance of what Jesus is doing to Peter. He is literally telling him, drop who you are, drop what you're doing, and come and follow me. This is what Peter was getting into. And they knew it. They knew what they were getting into. Surely during his life, Peter, uh, around the Galilee, he had seen rabbis and he had seen their pupils. Um, this, wasn't, uh, this wasn't new to Peter. It wasn't new to these guys that were being called out of the boat. This was, this was the lifestyle. This was the culture of the time. And it was a unique relationship that required a full-time commitment. Following Yeshua and being disciples of Yeshua is not a part-time gig. It's not. It's something that we do constantly. It's a way of life. It's forsaking our, our lifestyle that we used to live. It's forsaking who we used to be. It's forsaking us being in charge of our life and surrendering that control over to Yeshua. And this is powerful. Rabbi Akaba, he says, once I followed Rabbi Yahshua into a privy, a bathroom, and I learned three things from him. Ben Azai said to him, how did you dare take such liberties with your master? In other words, going into the bathroom with him. Akaba answered, it was a matter of Torah, and I'm required to learn. This is commitment, folks, that he would follow his rabbi into the bathroom so that he could observe everything. And I know it's kind of weird for us to think about that, but it's, it's, this is the commitment level that he had, that the rabbi says that I would go and follow my master into the restroom because it's a matter of Torah. It's a matter of learning. I wanted to learn everything from him, everything. And so uh, it's so important. This was not like today, where many people call themselves disciples of Yeshua, and they don't really follow Yeshua in all things, in all ways. We want to follow Yeshua on our terms, don't we? Like, like I'll do it as long as it's not inconvenient to me. I'll follow Jesus as long as it doesn't interrupt my, 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 my hobbies. It doesn't uh, interrupt my, the things that I like, right? And, and Jesus is calling us to something deeper, that if we're going to be followers of Yeshua, if we're going to be disciples of Yeshua, here's the thing about this. I, I need to say this, because I think it's super important, is that when a person is making the choice to follow Jesus, right, uh, it goes back to an old song that we have here, I'm, I have decided right? Y'all know the song? To follow Jesus, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. What's the next line? Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, 
no turning back. Look, the lifestyle of being a follower of Messiah is that we do it even though, man, it's not comfortable, even though no one goes with us. That's what it means to be a follower of Christ. If you look like the world, if you look like everybody else around us, I don't care if they call themselves Christian, and they're not living by the word of God. If they're, if there's not, you can't look in their life and go, man, there's something different about them. They're not obe- they're, you're, you're not obeying God. You're not obeying his commandments. You're not a disciple. You may be something else. So here's things that we have to take away, right? There are four responsibilities, four responsibilities of a disciple that would be required, that they would be required to do. So in Jesus's time, there are four requirements. There were four things that they must do. And there's four things that we, I think we should take to heart for us. Number one was to memorize, watch this, to memorize his teaching, memorize the teacher's words. Here's a question. When was the last time you memorized a verse of scripture? When was the last time you spent time in the Torah reading and memorizing it and working and sweating and and locking out the world, locking out distractions and media and social media and TV and radio and all, and just putting that stuff away for a season, right? And just focusing on reading the Bible, memorizing the teacher's words, the teachings of Moses, the teachings of Yeshua, the teachings of Paul, of Isaiah, of Daniel. When was the last time you memorized this stuff? That's one requirement. The second one is to learn the traditions of the teacher. What did they do? Remember what it says in the first John. We, we talked about this last week. Anyone who's going to call themselves a follower of Messiah must live as Messiah lived. What was, what were the traditions of Messiah Jesus? Then we should be doing those things, right? He went to synagogue. Look at, right? He went to synagogue. He went to the temple every Sabbath. Where are you every Sabbath? Are you at home? Are you watching the soccer game, the football game, all right? Watching sports, kicked up. You're, you're not honoring. Now, I know some of you, you don't have a place to go so that you can you can uh, honor but that's what Jesus did he went to a place and gathered with other believers he went to the temple all right number 3 the three the third thing is we imitate our teacher's actions how did Jesus act what was his action well he acted out of love for one right but he st- he stood strong on the torah he he held to the highest highest uh, things in his life, the Torah. Look at what the Bible said. Look at what he said about the Torah. He never came again. Matter of fact, Matthew 5, right? It says, do not think that I came to abolish the Torah, for I did not come to abolish the Torah, but I came to fulfill it, bring it to full expression. So it's very important that we see how our master lived and then imitate how he lived. And the fourth thing is to do what? Is to raise up more disciples, right? What did he tell the disciples when before he went away? He said, all power in heaven I, has been given unto me. Now go and make disciples of the nation. Are you making disciples? You may not be ready to make disciples because you're not a disciple yourself. Going to church on Sunday for one hour and going home is not a disciple. I'm just letting you know. Hard fact, hard truth. It is the, tr- it's the fact, right? Discipleship isn't one day a week. Discipleship is every day, every minute. Every hour, you're wanting to be more and more and more like the master, and that's being like Jesus. We have a great example of this, right, found in 1 Kings chapter 19. In verse King, 1 Kings 19, 19 through 21, I want to read this. This is the story of Elijah and Elijah. And so he departed from there and found Elisha, son of Shiphat, while he was plowing with 12 pairs of oxen before him, and he, and he with the 12. Then Elijah, remember Elijah, he was the prophet of the time, crossed over to him and threw his mantle on him. That's his, his talit. And so he left the oxen. Watch what he does. So, so here's the, here kind of a story. Right? Elisha is out doing farm work. He's doing work. And then uh, while he's doing that, Elijah comes by and he takes his, he takes his, Talit, and he lays it over Elijah. 
Verse 20 says, so he left the oxen and he ran after Elijah saying, let me please kiss my father and my mother and then I will follow you. Come back, he said to him, for what have I done to you? Now, this is a course of time that this happens. And this didn't happen like, like I know we read the scriptures and we think, oh, it just happened like in a minute. But this literally, uh, this literally was, it, it, it was over a course of time that this happened. So I don't want you to think that just immediately he's like, okay, I'm going to leave. This was some time of his learning and following you, following Elijah. And then he came to the place like, hey, I need to follow this guy. And so verse 21, so, so he returned from following him. There's that time of day and took the pair of oxen, the oxen that he was using. And what does he do? This is going all in. And he sacrificed them, boy of the flesh with the oxen's yoke and gear, and then gave it to the people and they ate. Then what does he do? He arose and he went after Elijah and became his attendant. Friends, this is this is commitment. This is going all in. This is what this is what uh, being a disciple and the twelve disciples. This is what they were being called into. So when Peter is called to leave um, his fishing gear and James and John with them, they were going in. They were burning the ships. Right? They were saying, "Okay, we're all in. We're not turning back." Right? So we see two important elements. One is that he was being chosen. Elijah was being chosen by Elijah. And he sees and he chooses Elijah. But we also see that Elijah, to be the, uh, to be the disciple, that he must accept the mantle that's being placed upon him. And that's what he did. Look here at the works of Josephus and what he says about this. Uh, he says, so Elijah upon hearing this charge, returned to the land of the Hebrews. And when he had found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, plowing and certain others with him, driving 12 yoke of oxen, he came to him. He cast his own garment upon him, upon which Elijah began to prophesy presently and leaving his oxen. Isn't that amazing? See, we don't see that in the Bible. So the works of Josephus says that when Elijah placed his mantle on Elisha, Elisha began to prophesy. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. And leaving his oxen, he followed Elijah. And when he desired to leave to salute his parent, Elijah gave him leave to do so. And when he had taken his servant of his leave of them, he followed him and became the disciple and the servant of Elijah all the days of his life. And thus, having dispatched the affairs in which his prophet was concerned. Hang on a minute. Had to turn this off for a minute. I was about to sneeze. Praise God. So this is a huge commitment. So he goes, kind of picture this, his way of life, which is the oxen and farming and all that. And when he decides to go follow Elijah, he literally burns everything. He, he destroys it all. That's heavy commitment, guys. This is what it means to have a life of discipleship, to give oneself fully to what he or she is being taught for the sake of making other disciples themselves. Looking at what Yeshua says in Luke 14, 25, verse 33, it says, now great crowds, watch this, great crowds were traveling with Yeshua and he turned and he said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not, watch this, does not hate his own father and mother wife, children, brothers, and sisters, and yes, even his own life. He cannot be my disciple. Now, does this mean that you're to go and start hating your mother and father? No, that's not what it means. This is a Hebrew idiom, and the people understood what was being said, that nothing should be greater than the relationship with the Father Yahweh. Nothing. Is there anything in your life today that you're giving more precedence, that you're putting more attention, more energy, more money, more everything into other than your walk with Yeshua? I would check that. Really, I would check that. See, the people understood during this time what was being said, that nothing should go before Yahweh. The theme of this verse is not alienation from one's family, but it's the cost of discipleship. Nothing, not the love of your father or your mother or even one's own life is to take precedence over the loyalty to Yahweh and his Messiah, Jesus. We must renounce all that we have, acknowledging that if Yahweh is to be primary in our life, 
our possessions, and even our social relationship in and of themselves must be secondary. Being a messianic, being a Torah observant follower is more than merely acknowledging facts about Yeshua. It's living like Yeshua. Let's go on over to Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 20. Watch. Adonai your God, you will fear. Him will you serve. To him will you cling. And by his name will you swear. So this is all about living for Yahweh. This is all about this life. This is what draws people to come into a relationship like we did. I had a hunger and a desire to be more than just this, this, this carnal Christian. And what happens is when you hunger and you thirst, book of Matthew, right? When you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you will be filled. And what happens is you will come to a new understanding, a new knowledge of who Messiah is. This is transforming power in your life. And you can't get that from a mediocre Christian walk. You will not get it. When you don't commit yourself to be a follower and a disciple of Jesus, you're not going to come into this relationship. This is what I've seen. Probably if there was a, uh, what, what, what does every, what is the commonality between every person that I have met that was a Sunday churchgoer? That was someone who who went to church on Sunday, believed in Jesus, but knew there was something more. Every one, every one of them had this commonality, and that is they knew there was something more, and they wanted to follow Yeshua with everything they had. Most Sunday preachers, most Sunday goers don't have that commitment. They're okay with coming to church on Sunday, as I said before, right? They're okay with that. But man, to really follow Messiah, when you begin to really have a hunger and thirst for him, friend, I'm telling you, man, you're going to see scripture in a different light. You're going to see Jesus and his 12 disciples in a different light. You're going to see Paul in a different light. You're going to see Moses in a different light. I am telling you right now, it is phenomenal. It is powerful. This is awesome. It will transform your life. Luke chapter 14, verse 27, whoever does not carry his own cross, watch this church, and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you wanting to build a tower, this is where we fail, doesn't first sit down and figure out the cost. Friend, have you sat down and considered what it means to be a follower of Jesus? Have you considered the cost? He's telling you in verse 27 what the cost is. Did you see what he said? Whoever does not carry his own cross. This isn't about carrying a burden, right? Like I've got a burden for lost people. I've got a burden for my brother or my mom or my dad getting saved. No, 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 no. This is about death. This is about considering the cost that to be a follower of Yeshua, to be a true follower of Yeshua means that you are willing to die that you're willing to lay down your life, that you're willing to say, you know what, I'm forsaking everything. That's what it means. Matter of fact, I think I, I may have it here later, but it says that many, many will not taste of death until they come face to face with Messiah at Judgment Day. What does that mean? It means that we're not willing to die to this flesh. We're not willing to die to the natural cravings of this world. We're willing to give in to those and not give in to the spiritual cravings of, of following Jesus and reading his Torah and fasting and prayer and living like Jesus. That's the, that's the, whole, the, whole, the whole thing, right? Because, see, this is where we run into modern Christianity in that we have a spiritual experience and we've not really stopped and considered the cost of what it means to follow Messiah. A famous Christian application of this principle was formulated in the 17th century by a guy named Blaise Pascal. Uh, he was a founder of a mathematical probability theory and it was known as Pascal's Wager. His idea is that rationally, whether or not to believe in Yeshua's Messiahship, Lordship, and the Atonement should depend on two factors, and that were uh, the value of what you stand to gain or lose by believing or not, and the probability that it is true, which determined the probability of your receiving those gain or losses. In other words, 
did you follow Jesus based on what you would gain or lose? And a lot of Christians, that's how they do it. They're okay with understanding who Jesus is and following, but they're not really willing to, to make him your disciple because the cost is too great. That's why Jesus said, he said that the road is narrow for those who find the way. And the, the road to destruction and death is broad, and many will find that because many are not willing to count the cost and to live out this life that's going to require great sacrifice. Following Jesus is not something you just do on a whim. It's something you need to consider. It's something you're saying you're willing to give it all up. In Luke 14, going on, continuing in verse 29, it says, Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and isn't able to finish everything, all will see it began begin to mock. In other words, you start a project, you don't consider it, you start living for Jesus, you don't consider the cost, and then by halfway through when you realize how tough it's going to be, you give up, and everybody sees it. Verse 30 saying, this man began to build and wasn't able to finish, and that's what people will say. Or what king going to make war against another king won't first sit down to consider whether he is able with 10,000 to confront the one coming against him with 20,000? Verse 32, if not, while the other is still far away, he sends an ambassador and then asks for peace. Verse 33, so in the same way, whoever does not renounce all that he has, watch, cannot be my disciple. Look, friends, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't write this, man. This is what Yeshua himself is saying in the book of Luke, verse 33, chapter 14. So in the same way, whoever does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. No wonder why Jesus said at one point, he said, many are going to come unto me and cry, Lord, Lord, did we not do all of these things in your name? And he'll say, depart from me, you doers of iniquity, for I've never known you. They've never considered the cost of what it means to follow. Philippians chapter 3, 7 and 8 says, But whatever things were gained to me, this is Paul, these I have considered as loss for the sake of Messiah. More than that, I consider all things to be lost in comparison to the surpassing value of the knowledge of Messiah Yeshua, my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I consider them garbage in order that I might gain a Messiah. He counted the cost rationally and correctly. He understood Pascal's wager, a millennium and a half before Pascal formulated it, and he drew the appropriate conclusion. See, when the disciples, or even Peter, uh, in this case, walked away from the boat, he wasn't being haste. He was doing this very thing. He was leaving his former life to follow the Messiah. And the disciples, all the disciples, they were going all in. And I want us to pick, I want us to pick up on this. I want you to feel the weight of what it means to follow and understand what the disciples and the others, what they all have thought. They knew what they were going, getting into. They knew what it meant because of the culture. They knew what it meant to be a follower of Messiah. That's really what the expression of baptism is all about. Baptism isn't just about getting wet and, and you're not saved because you're baptized. You understand that? Salvation comes by faith. Then what does, what does this mean? It means that when you are immersed, is that you are publicly professing that you are giving up everything and you are going to be a disciple and a follower of Messiah. That's what they did back in that day. That when you were going to be a follower of a particular rabbi, you would go and be immersed in his name so that everyone would know publicly that you were a disciple of this, whatever that rabbi is. When you are immersed in the water, you are laying down your life. You are forsaking the flesh and you are coming up a new creation and you are making the profession, Jesus is my Lord and he is my master and I'm following after him. That's why you shouldn't just do this lightly. You should consider the cost. Luke 5, 1 through 8. It happened that the crowds were pressing upon Yeshua to hear the word of God as he was standing by the lake of Kinneret. When he saw two boats standing beside the lake, now the fishermen had left them and were washing the nets. Getting into one of the boats, Simon's boat, Yeshua asked him to push out away from the land. Then sitting down, he taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Go out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon replied, 
Master, we've worked hard all night and caught nothing, but at your word, I will let down the nets. When they, when they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boats to come and help them. They came and filled both boats so, so full that they began to sink. Watch what happened. But when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Yeshua's knees saying, go away from me, master, for I am a sinful man. Listen to me this morning or tonight or wherever you're at. This is a powerful encounter for Peter. Notice his repentant heart. I'm a sinful man. In other words, I am lawless, which goes along with what we've known about fishermen. There were some rough dudes. This, in fact, is Peter's transformation. He knows who is in the boat with him. See, this is, this is the response of someone who knows who is in front of them. This is the response of someone who realizes who Jesus is, is that we, we come to a place when we see Jesus face to face and we get on our face and we repent. We repent and we understand that our life will never be the same. 2 Samuel 6, 9, watch. So David was frightened of Adonai that day. And then he said, how can the ark of Adonai come to me? See, even David, when coming face to face with Adonai, with the Lord, he knew. He knew who he was. Just, just as Peter, just as Paul, when Paul seen Yeshua on the way to Damascus, what did he do? He fell on his face. Because he recognized who he was and he was the Lord. I want you to feel this. I heard recently how we have taken the spiritual thing. The great teacher, man, a friend of mine now, a great, a great, wonderful guy named Lex Meyer, man. I encourage you to go on to YouTube and follow this guy. He's an amazing teacher. But he once said, I heard him in a meeting one time, he said that we have taken the spiritual things of God, of Yahweh, and we have made them so common. There's very little fear of God anymore. So we take our salvation for granted. We have become numb to God's presence and his holiness. You know, everyone knows John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, right? But do we know verse 20 and 21? Let's look at it. John chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. For everyone else, for everyone who does evil, hates the light and does not come to the light so that their deeds will not be exposed. But whoever practices the truth comes to the light so that it may be made known that his deeds have been accomplished in God. See, when we come to the knowledge of Messiah, a disciple doesn't run from the light. He runs to Messiah. He runs to the master and says, man, search my heart. Know my thoughts. This is what it means to be a disciple, that we allow the master to point out the things in our life. And a person that is sinful, a person that doesn't want to be in his presence, they're evil. They don't want their, 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 the plans, they don't want their works exposed. Isaiah 59 and 2, rather your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. Your sins have hidden his faith from you so that you so that he does not hear. Sin always drives us to flee from the presence of Yahweh. Yet when we look at the disciples, we see two different realities. Yeshua knew who Peter was, and Peter had seen who was in his boat. Yeshua's response to Peter's fear of sin, fear not, Peter. I will make you a fisher of man. You will be my disciple. You see, when we come into the presence of Yahweh and we truly understand who he is, when we understand who Yeshua is, the reality of our life will begin to change. Luke 5, 10 and 11. So also Jacob and John, Zebedee's sons, who were partners with Simon. But Yeshua said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. So when they had brought the boat to the landing, what? They left everything and followed him. Guys, I want to close up with this statement. True discipleship is not about fitting God into our life. It's about us leaving our life and following him. That's why I think that's what drove us. That really is the driving force for me and for many that are in our community today. 
is that we knew there was more and we were willing to lay down everything that we thought we knew to follow Yeshua. And when that happens, a great revelation happens about, about his word, about things like we're fixing to celebrate, right? Hanukkah and Christmas and how Christmas is, Christmas is wrong. It doesn't point to Jesus. It doesn't point. And I had someone uh, address me because of my episode last week, and I love what she had said. You know, and there does come a point where we have to look at the reality of the things that are being done in Christmas and the holidays and how pagan it is. Well, what happens is the closer you grow to Jesus, the closest you, you come to really laying your life down and confessing that he is the master and you are the disciple, the realities of the things that we see that are happening in this world become known. And we really begin to see that we've been worshiping him wrong. And we need truth. We need the truth of Yeshua, and that comes in the form of the Torah. You can't escape it, church. You cannot escape it, loved ones. Man, I hope this has blessed you. I want to pray for you, and I want to challenge you to, man, look in your life and to remove. If there is sin in your life, I am begging you, as we started in the beginning, teshuvah, repent, turn back, put on the identity of Messiah and let him be your disciple. Let him be your master, and you become his disciple. Fully committed follower, a fully committed, obeying his Torah, obeying everything that he has taught and learned. Man, it's amazing when that happens, the revelation that comes. I want to pray for you, and then we're going to be dismissed. Father, in the name of Yeshua, I pray for every, everyone in the sound of my voice. I pray that you would bless them. I pray that you would open their hearts to receive your word. I pray that if they don't know Jesus, if they don't know Yeshua, if they've not surrendered, if they've not repented of sin, Father, that today would be that day that they turn and repent, Father. I pray for those who may be living a lukewarm life and they're, they know there's more. Father, I pray that you'd show them. I pray, Lord God, that their lives would be changed. I pray for transformation. And I pray for those who are hungering for you, who thirst for you, Lord, that you would fill them. Fill them with your Torah. Fill them with your word. Fill them with your Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKadosh, right now in the name of Yeshua. Father, I pray that their eyes would be open, that they would know the hope that is within them. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for the technology and the ability to do what we're doing today. And Lord, I thank you so much for all that you're doing and what you're going to do in the lives of many people. We love you in the name of Yeshua. We pray, amen. Man, if you are, uh, if you're in the area of Terrell, Chant- Qual Avenue in Terrell, Texas. We would love to have you. Join us on Facebook Live. We have our, our we, th- we thyme account where we live stream our our services every every day. You can download our Epic Life Church app, ELC Incorporated. Uh, look for it. Look for our logo there that's on there. It's absolutely amazing. Man, I'm Mike Scan. I am so, so honored that I get to speak to all of you across the world. I hope you are blessed and you find the life that you were created to live, the Epic Life in Yeshua, our Messiah. We'll see you then.